Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Ian Laspina, and today we're gonna to be talking about Besigues and some other forms of shoulder rondels. So what is a Besigue? Now, in its simplest form, it's essentially a rondel or a uh, circular piece of plate armor, although we'll see that they're not always round, uh, that is used to defend the gap that is left by the edge of the breastplate and the edge of the uh, spalder or shoulder defense. Now, we know that this place is a little bit difficult to protect in plate armor because, uh, well, you need mobility through there. You need to be able to move your arm across your body. And if the breastplate didn't have that cut out for the armhole, your arm would hit it way out here and you wouldn't be able to get your arms uh, where you need to in order to be able to fight effectively. Now, there are a few different ways to defend this gap. Um, as we'll see in the 15th century with the development of full pauldrons, uh, the shoulder defense itself could overlap the breastplate, almost eliminating that gap entirely, but that doesn't come without its own compromises. Uh, the English were experimenting with little lobed projections and extensions of the lames on the shoulder defense to kind of help fill that gap. But something like this, a besigue, could easily be hung in that gap, and it's a very simple piece of kit that's, that's uh, effective at filling that void. Now, historically, um, in the early 14th century, what we see are these, these rondels are essentially being laced directly to the underlying mail, possibly the underlying arming garment, uh, being worn as a supplemental piece of plate armor for the male hauberk. Um, over time, as plate uh, arm harnesses develop a little bit more, we're still seeing the besigue up there, up on the shoulder. Um, even as more sophisticated shoulder defenses are, are being developed, the besigue is kind of being used in that supplementary role to give yourself a little bit more coverage. Um, now, for whatever reason, in the second half of the 14th century, the use of the besigue becomes a lot more scarce until it reemerges in the early 15th century, and then we see it basically in use for the remainder of the uh, late Middle Ages into the Renaissance into the 16th century. So with its reemergence in the early 15th century, what may have started as a relatively simple, flat, circular, ovoid plate um, develops a little bit more complexity. Uh, we start to see a little bit of dished concavity to its form. Uh, the overall silhouette gives way to a lot of different shapes. The uh, circular version really never goes away, but alongside that we see kind of um, elongated rectangles, kidney shapes, crescent shapes. Um, you even see some that are essentially miniaturized pavises, which is really cool. Um, later in the 16th century, the circular form remains very popular, but one addition that they did is they started to draw the center out into a very prominent point or spike. Now, in order to wear the besigue, um, it can be, as we saw before, laced directly to the male or potentially the underlying arming garment. Um, it could be suspended directly from the existing shoulder armor uh, via a riveted leather or some other form of suspension. Uh, and then depending on exactly how you define a besigue, if we look at this example, you can see here that uh, the piece of the armor that's fulfilling the function of the besigue is actually integrated directly into the shoulder armor itself, uh, which brings me to my next point, which is the besigue also offers an opportunity for decoration, with this one being engraved. Um, Depending on exactly the geographic location, stylistic preference, and things like that, uh, you might see stuff like decorative rivet work, uh, be the, the uh, besigue being edged in a contrasting metal, um, you might see fluting, you might see engraving or etching, um, roped borders, so there are a lot of different ways to kind of dress up that besigue. All right, so I wanna talk about placement for a minute. Now, when we talk about besigues, oftentimes it comes up as a defense for the armpit, and it does defend the armpit to some extent, but it's also doing a lot more than that. Um, that kind of preoccupation with it defending the armpit sometimes makes people wanna wear it so low on the body that it's almost kind of hanging on the outside of the pec muscle, almost literally in the hollow of the armpit. And when we look at a lot of the historical sources, what we see is that the besigues worn a lot higher, more directly in front of the glenohumeral joint, um, ironically leaving the armpit hollow itself uh, kind of visually exposed even with the besigue in place. 
Now, when we think about this, it makes sense. You've got a lot of important structures in the shoulder that are not only accessible through the armpit, but also straight through the front as well, especially if you've got a big gap there uh, as a result of the configuration of armor you're wearing. You've got the joints of the shoulder itself. Uh, you've got all the nerves that run through the shoulder to innervate the arm. And then of course, uh, probably most importantly for our purposes, you have that big axillary artery that runs through the shoulder as it transitions into the brachial artery. So while the Besigu importantly plays that role in defending the armpit, it may not be um, as simple as passively defending against those extreme low angle shots. Um, it may be a little bit more positional and uh, a little bit more, a uh, little bit more required of actively defending that part of your body uh, because it's still playing a vital role in defending uh, against shots right into the joint and right into those structures via the front of your shoulder. So the other day I had the opportunity to discuss this with Arna Kutz. And if you don't know who Arna is, there'll be a link in the description below to a spectacular uh, historical event that he put on a few years ago. But he's very experienced in historical horsemanship. Uh, he jousts at the highest level with uh, historical solid lances and steel coronels, very experienced fencer and instructor of all of those things. Now from his perspective as a horseman, what he was saying is that spot on the body where we typically see that the, the placement of the Besigu is one of the best spots on the body to place a lance shot because it affords uh, the most purchase of that lance into the target. And if you can gain the most purchase, that means the maximum energy transfer, the more energy transfer, the better shot you have at penetrating. And if you can get a penetrating lance shot uh, right through that part of the body, not only is it gonna destroy the shoulder joint it could potentially sever that artery, and then you get to bleed to death. Uh, depending on the angle, you know, it may even open a, uh, a nice path directly into the chest cavity towards the heart. Um, there are a lot of things that can go wrong for the person getting hit there, and especially when we're talking about the 15th century, when those lance shots are rest assisted because you have a, uh, a lance rest attached to that solid breastplate. The other thing to think about as well, not only can that, that Besigu placement be vitally important to defending yourself against the lance shot, but on the weapon side, if you have that Besigu way down here, it's going to interfere with your own ability to couch your lance. So now with all of that in mind, and I think this kind of underlines the point about how vitally important that area is to protect. Um, these sources that Tom Billiter initially drew my attention to show fully developed pauldrons where that gap is essentially eliminated, but still using a Besigu or a Rondel to reinforce that part of the body. And what Arna was explaining is not only will that provide an additional layer of steel effectively thickening the armor in that, that spot um, where you're going to get hit the hardest, but um, by the nature of the Besigu, the way that it's shaped and kind of its ability to move under impact, um, it can actually take some of the force out of that, reduce the ability of that lance to gain purchase, and help drive that lance off the shoulder armor, kind of enhancing the deflective capability of the pauldron, which I found very interesting. All right, so next we're gonna take a closer look at my reproduction here before I put them on so you can see what they look like with the rest of the armor. Uh, but I had a pair of these made for me by Jeff Wasson to go along with some of the other updated components of my harness. Uh, they are a simple circular shape, but they are a little bit uh, concave and then they kind of rise again in the center, as you can see, so that the shape is a little bit more complex than just a flat disc. Um, on the top of the center there, you can see that we have some floral decorative rivet work in brass, which is based on a couple examples from early 15th century sources. Uh, if we flip it over, you can see how it's going to attach. So that rivet is securing that leather tab, and then there's a couple other rivets in there to help stabilize that leather tab. And this is going to simply lace onto my um, male sleeves. Now, I chose to go with this particular suspension method instead of attaching it directly to my shoulder armor, uh, basically because of the nature of the living history that I do. Sometimes, um, even though we've been doing more early 15th century lately, uh, sometimes we do 1380s, where a Besigu may not be as appropriate to wear with that style of armor. So this is a very easy way to omit it when I'm in the 1380s versus when I'm in the early 1400s, um, I can simply lace it on where it needs to go. Okay, so putting that, hey, buddy, my eyes are up here. 
Uh, I'm just kidding. So here's what the vesicles look like being worn. You can see as I start to move, they're going to slide across the other front surfaces of the armor so that I retain my mobility with them on. Now we know against an armored opponent, the front of the shoulder and the gap in the armpits are going to be kind of a juicy target. But with those vesicles there, uh, the frontal aspect of that target is pretty obscured. Uh, especially compared to this where you can see the um, gap created by the cutout of the breastplate and the edge of the spalders. And of course, that gap is there because um, you need to be able to draw your arm across your chest, making that a rather difficult place to defend. So if I freeze the, f the frame here and then bring back the helmet, at least half of it, you can see how the mail of the helmet is actually acting to help fill in part of that gap by doubling the layer of mail over the top of the shoulder um, and out in front of the clavicle, kind of near your AC joint. And of course, on later designs like a great bassinet, this part would be um, reinforced by rigid plate instead of just mail. So now if we bring back the Besigu, you can see compared to the other side, that kind of direct highway straight into the front of your glenohumeral joint and all the juicy arteries that run through your armpit are now almost completely obscured. Now, of course, if we start to do something a little bit more dynamic and move around, uh, vulnerabilities will be opened up again. But um, as a person who's going to be aware of these vulnerabilities, you're going to be intelligently defending yourself. And of course, um, the protection offered by the Besigues is significantly more coverage than without them. All right, guys, so the, the Besigue, you know, at first glance, it, it appears very simple. It doesn't have any uh, fancy articulations, any moving parts or anything like that. But as we saw, um, hopefully you gain an appreciation for how vitally important it can be in certain situations. And maybe that its use is a little bit more subtle, a little bit more varied than uh, you may have originally thought. And um, as always, guys, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider leaving a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. And thank you very much to my patrons on Patreon who make the channel possible in the first place. We'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.